Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to take a slight departure from talking about you specifically. We're going to talk about your pets. Yes, of course, it involves you. You are pet parents if you have pets. And in divorce, pets come up a lot. Lots of considerations around pets. And so the first thing I want to say is, please check the laws of your state for pet custody. I know they've changed considerably in the last four years in California, but even before 2019, I've had some settlement agreements accepted by judges with pet custody provisions and others rejected on the basis of no law existing to support pet custody decisions when judges go to review the settlement agreements. So very important that you check the laws of your state. Who knows what they are? Yet you need help. So in doing research before recording this episode, I ran across a great article on pet custody uh, by Manila Law Group in Los Angeles. There's a short video and information to help Californians understand the current state of pet custody. The link is provided for your convenience in the show notes. Uh, but I want to read from the article for you because some people just like to get all their information listening to the podcast and, and they don't want to take uh, the extra time to do this. So let me read this first. It's brief. And then I want to go back to the rest of uh, what I want to um, share with you in regards to pet custody decisions that I've seen in my years as a family law mediator. So pets uh, are no longer just physical property. So that's the first section from the Manila Law Group. Well, before I even read from this, pets are no longer just physical property. Of course, my demented mind went to the movie Ted. Remember Ted? So <laughs> Mark Wahlberg was the lead actor. And then uh, Seth MacFarlane, who wrote the movie, was the voice of Ted. Ted was a teddy bear that uh, Mark Wahlberg's character grew up with because Mark didn't have a lot of friends and therefore Ted became his best friend. And Ted, of course, talks in the movie, the voice of Seth MacFarlane, who wrote Family Guy, by the way, if you don't know that. Um, and in Ted Part 2, I typically don't like sequels, but in Ted Part 2, Ted was wanted to have a child and get married um, to someone he met at the grocery store where he was working. I'm sorry, this movie killed me. Uh, and uh, Ted was deemed a non-entity property. He was deemed a teddy bear without a heart and soul. Therefore, he was the property of Mark, Mark Wahlberg's character. Okay, I just have to say this. Now I'm going to read from the article. Pets are, are no longer just physical property. Up until the new law was enacted, and I believe that's 2019 with modifications up to 2023, which is the year we're in, California courts treated pets like other physical inanimate property, such as furniture, cars, and other belongings. The family dog, cat, or another pet would be considered a part of the property to be divided when the marriage ended. Ouch. Often judges would base their decision on which party purchased or adopted the animal Judges had wide discretion in determining where the pet would be best placed or in arranging visitation schedules. Yes, arranging visitation schedules. This is amazing. The legal system, however, offered no official guidance up until this year. Only Alaska and Illinois had similar legislation with the signing of AB 2274, California courts must now view pet ownership differently from other possessions. Okay, next section, putting a pet first. 
courts now have a much clearer direction and will award custody of a pet based on what is deemed best for the animal. They're also available to create shared custody agreements and may enter orders orders that may require one party to care for a pet prior to final ownership determination. So you know you've heard the phrase best interest of the child. We now have best interest of the pet. Seriously, this is really amazing. I love animals. So I'm really happy, kind of, that the courts are getting involved. But just like people are very unhappy over human custody arrangements, I'm kind of thinking they're going to be a little unhappy over animal custody arrangements, but let me read further. Pets are still technically classified as personal property, but the new law was crafted to reflect how most people view their pets. The bill's sponsor, Assemblyman Bill Quirk, was inspired to introduce the bill. Oh, the bill being AB 2274 uh, was inspired to introduce the bill based in part on his experience rescuing a dog. The original bill had stronger language, for example, quote, requiring, end quote, rather than, quote, authorizing, end quote, courts to act in the pet's best interest. Changes notwithstanding California law is groundbreaking in that it provides courts with much needed guidance in in distinguishing pets from other forms of property. I'm really sorry, I'm tripping on a couple words. This is a most important episode today because my own cat, Bethina, is getting operated on dental surgery. She's about 16 years old, looks to be in great health, but it's still very worrisome putting pets under anesthesia. So as I'm recording this podcast, I'm on pins and needles waiting for the vet to get back to me and tell me that she's okay. So I apologize for this, but that's where that's where the tripping over the words is coming from. Changes notwithstanding, uh, California law is groundbreaking in that Oh, sorry about that. Already read it. Provides much needed courts guidance. All right. Next section. Treating treating animals fairly. This is huge. Family pet custody battles have been on the rise. When they reflect a pet's important role in the family, they've also added conflict to an often already stressful situation. If you're involved in a custody case involving a family pet, the Animal League Defense Fund, which ranked California number three in the nation for its animal protection laws, may provide an amicus brief. Okay, so read this. Click on the highlighted areas. So now I'm encouraging you to click on the link I provided in the show notes. This is interesting. It'll take you to different places. Before getting into a lengthy, expensive battle over the family pet, remember that California's law does not require a judge to make a conclusion. It merely gives guidance on what can be used to determine such situations. Okay, this is interesting. And now they have final thoughts. Before this law was enacted, pets were simply treated as any other inanimate piece of property, such as a TV or a dining room table. I mean, that hurts my heart. Now there are much clearer guidelines out as to how custody of a pet will be handled and is based upon what the court deems as best interest for the animal. For those who have a family pet, this new law may help bring some peace of mind as they navigate the already stressful divorce process. Now, let me read from my extended notes on this because there's a lot more to say. As a mediator, I've worked with divorcing or separating pet owners to come to compromise on how to handle the ownership, support, and care of animals. Some cases were easy and others weren't. Here are some examples and considerations for 
who gets the pet? Number one, did the animals belong to one spouse prior to marriage or were they brought into the family during marriage? Well, that seems to be fairly easy, right? If it was your pet first, even though the other spouse more than likely contributed love, attention, exercise, vet bills, food, everything you need for your animals. Still, when people are divorcing, most people want the other owner, the original owner to have the animal. But number two, even if they belong to one spouse before marriage, did the other spouse become more attached to the animals and vice versa during marriage? Well, that sometimes happens. You know, even though an animal may be brought into the marriage by one spouse, the other spouse may be a better pet owner, have a bigger heart for animals, spend more time with the animals. So that really has to be taken into consideration by the original pet owner. Think about it. This is best interest of the animal now. Uh, number three, where will each spouse live post-marriage? And can their next home or apartment slash condo allow pets? Or if they do, how many pets and what type of pets? Okay, so goldfish, turtles are a lit, well, turtles in a, an aquarium, not land roaming turtles. But dogs, okay, definitely a top of the no list of animals if you're going to apartments or condos, because these places are too small for animals to live. They're, that you have neighbors in close order that may not want to hear the animal barking or meowing. And pet owners are really concerned about the upkeep of the apartment, a small dwelling. Number four, is it possible and healthy for the animals to be divided? Animals go through grieving at the loss of a life that is close to them, just like humans. Okay, so here we have a situation where you have two or three cats and the owners are okay dividing the cats and they kind of know who's gonna get which cat, but do the cats wanna be divided? See, that's the really important thing too. How is this going to affect the animals? Animals grieve. They grieve the loss of the other animals. Like you, you have to remember if both spouses are working during the day and nobody else is home, the animals bond. They have each other for companionship. So if you take an animal, if you have two animals and they're connected, you separate them. Trust me, one or both animals is going to go through a huge grieving process and grief causes health issues. It really does. Or what if you have three animals and one spouse gets one animal, the other spouse gets two animals. The animal that's left alone definitely is going to grave unless it's an animal that craved solo singular attention. Sometimes animals don't want to be with other animals. Well, in that case, separating them is great as long as you know which animal wants to be alone. So please be mindful of this as you're looking at dividing the animals. Number five, long distance custody. Should pets be transported back and forth to different homes? Oh my God. Cats hate cars. Generally, cats hate, car hate cars, except there's this um, couple on Instagram. Oh, I wish I could remember the handle. They came to fame and fortune during the pandemic because they did the most amazing videos of their cats. I just thought of this. I, I, I'm sorry, I hadn't prepared for it. It just came to mind that they had their cats doing like crazy things the cats would never do, like dressing them up, putting them in the car, taking them to the beach, putting them in the water, in the bathtub, giving them spa days in the house. These cats were incredible. 
if you're a pet owner and a pet lover, I bet you've seen these this married couple on Instagram, billions of followers, I think, at a certain point. And some pet food company hired them to be spokespeople. I, I mean, these are the best videos I've ever seen. But long distance, okay. Cats don't like to travel. It is a known fact. Cats hate the movement of cars. Dogs are okay traveling. But first of all, you know, we spend a lot of time on the living arrangements for children. You know, this schedule 223, well, it may work out for the parents, but it may not work out for the kids. Or every other day, I can't think of a more horrific schedule than every other day with kids. Um, when possible, one week, one off, one week on, one week off, but now you're looking at animals. And so if you're looking at trading off a pet custody schedule, pay attention to the behavior that may change with your animals because they're trying to tell you, mom, dad, this is not working for me. Moving animals around, definitely cats, no bueno, not really good. So more stable homes for these animals would be better. Dogs, I don't know. You, you really have to, again, pay attention to the behavior of your dogs as you're doing this because dogs need stability as well. Years ago, before I bought the company that I now own and uh, file in Divorce Resource Incorporated and, and do mediations for, uh, the former owner loved and did tons of pet custody mediation. And she had a situation that was bi-coastal. Very wealthy couple. Actually, one was a celebrity. Two homes on each coast, East Coast, West Coast. We're a West Coast company. And it was acrimonious. I mean, they tried making it animal amicable, but it was acrimonious. Um, they actually did an arrangement where they shipped the dogs across country. I pause for a minute because it was such a horrific thing to do. And I mean horrific. And this puts a mediator in a very tough situation because you have to be neutral. You have to write up the agreements the way the couples want them. I don't know how much research was done at the time on how prohibitive this might be, putting large dogs, I believe these were large dogs, in crates every couple of weeks and shipping them across country. You know, for me as a mediator, I would either recuse myself or I would lose my neutrality. I mean, this is horrible to admit. There are certain things where I will just speak out on. And if it's for the protection of an animal, I will talk about it. And I'll talk about it in a respectful way. I'll talk about it in a way that will provide education and guidance so that the people can rethink this idea and not do this to an animal. I mean, haven't you been on planes lately where people are putting their dogs under seats and or buying seats for them just so they don't have to be put in cargo? I mean, can you imagine what an animal feels like in cargo? Well, it's not good. I'm speaking up for all animals. Would you like it as a person? If you wouldn't like it as a person, your animal doesn't like it. Believe me. But um, I think that they stopped it. I think that after maybe a month, even the pet owners in this story said, no, no, we don't want to do it. But just the idea. People don't know how to care for their animals. Which brings me to number six. Do both spouses understand how to care for the pets? Some people have incorrect ideas about the proper care of animals. Well, I just gave you one example. Going to give you another that I actually worked on. So I had people come to the office simply for pet custody. It wasn't about divorce. It was pet custody. So in this mediation, I realized that innocently, and I mean innocently, the husband had no clue how to treat an animal. He thought he was doing the right thing by keeping the animal outside 24-7 without shelter. 
and it gets hot here in California. It gets into the 90s and hundreds. Yes, he just didn't know. So I'm so happy I didn't get angry or upset that I said, you know, let's just go into a discussion about the care of animals and let's talk about what your views are and, you know, what I have learned. And maybe we can go on the internet and get some more information, you know, just so the best decisions can be made. And I'm so happy I approached it that way because he was willing to change. He had no idea. He thought like a lot of people think, well, they're animals. What do they need shelter for? That's what he thought. When you have an animal that likes living outside, because there are animals who actually like being outside, you still have to provide shelter for them. You have to have a dog house. You have to have food and water 24-7, clean food and water 24-7. The shelter has to be in the shade. And if you have absolutely no shade, create shade. Create a situation where there is shade. Because they go through the same physical trauma that humans do. They really do. I mean, they have they have bodies that have hearts and lungs and organs and so they need the proper care and upkeep so put yourself in your pet's position and if you would be uncomfortable your pet is too guaranteed and i'm so happy that mediation turned out well i really am because i would have gotten another call trust me from the other parent who didn't want the pet outside 24 7 without shelter Plus, pets need attention. If a dog is barking outside, trust they want to come in. They want to be around people. You know, they're they're people pe they're people animals. Yes, they like to be connected to people. Okay, number seven. Tough situation when people are seriously in debt, and one spouse physically agrees to keep the animals and asks the other spouse for help with food, veterinary care, and pet sitting costs. If there are two or more animals, even cats, as opposed to dogs, apartment landlords aren't open to renting to people with multiple pets. They're looking at the potential damage to the apartment and the noise. Well, I know I said that, but this really rings true when one spouse has to take the animals. So, yes, we know this limits where people can go, but here's the other thing. When people have issues in their relationship, what do they do sometimes? They think having a child will bring them closer together. And it doesn't. A child is hard enough to bring into a relationship that's a good relationship because it'll put strain. The care and upkeep of children is huge. Well, the same thing with animals, but animals can't talk. Animals, they give you signs when there's something wrong with them at a certain point. So when people are in debt and get more animals, it, it literally rips the relationship apart. Now you have to care for these animals. And if one person cannot keep the animals, maybe this person travels for a living and there's just no way they could keep the animals. Well, then the other person either has to keep the animals or dare I say, adopt them out. I mean, that's probably the hardest thing to do. Adopt your animals out. But listen, if you're going to continue to go deeper and deeper in debt by having animals, I mean, you have to be practical at some point in time. And that's a hard statement for me to make, a pet owner. So think about this. If you're in debt, don't get more animals. Don't get more animals, man. And get pet insurance <laughs> because that veterinary care will kill you. I've just gone through it with three animals. Unbelievable, the cost of veterinary care now. Okay, some words of advice. I want to finish with this segment. Keep your focus. Don't get more animals if the relationship is rocky. People sometimes get more pets, just like people who decide to have a child, thinking this will bring the couple closer. It doesn't. It's just one more expense and obligation that will continue to destroy the relationship. 
Next, be self-aware. If one spouse works a lot and doesn't have time to be attentive and attentive pet owner, don't ask for custody, but participate in the financial care of the animals so that your soon-to-be former spouse doesn't have to shoulder the entire responsibility. If you're asked to contribute, contribute. If you're having a discussion about who's better to take care of the animals, understand your daily routine. Three, C, be realistic. If one spouse lives one to two to three hours away, don't ask them to watch the animals if this, is, if this will be logistically too challenging. You're setting yourself up for disappointment and it's impractical. How else can this spouse help if not by physically being part of the animal's life? This also continues to connect the couple, the former spouses, when you're getting divorced. And divorce many times has to have people go their separate ways in order to live their best lives. So yes, children connect couples until the children are truly adult. Well, they still get connected, but, you know, connected on a daily basis. Animals, the same thing. So if you're getting divorced because you want to live separate lives, live separate lives. Make decisions that allow the animals to carry on their lives well as you're carrying on your life well. D, love the pets so much that you're willing to make the hard decisions that will provide the best life for them. Let the spouse who can be the best pet parent take the lead in animal caring with as much financial support as you can offer. Okay, I just want to break for a second and say, if there's a situation where the animals were owned by one spouse before marriage, but now you're, you married this spouse and you find, oh, shoot, he or she doesn't know how to take care of an animal. They think putting the animal in a cage most of the day is the right thing to do. You know, sometimes you do have to put the animal in a cage, but you certainly have to make sure the cage is big enough that the animal can turn around, you know, can stretch out. You know, people don't understand how large a cage has to be. And a cage, I am told by animal trainers, is a safe haven for animals. So that's great. So, in a, so a cage can be a safe haven, but it can't be where the pet lives 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day. The animal has to walk around and exercise. I mean, it's a living being. Sorry, we'll get off my soapbox. But if the new spouse <laughs> uh, is a better pet owner and can take care of the animal, if you're the original owner, please give it some thought to let your soon-to-be sp uh, former spouse take care of the animals. And E, consult with anim animal care specialists who can help determine which spouse is better at daily animal care. An animal trainer typically can help with the assessment for future pet ownership and care. They can also read the behavior of the animal, which can also help determine the better pet parent and home in which the animals will live. An educated third party can do wonders for guiding pet owners to the best decisions for their animals and themselves. So let's just say you've already decided who's getting the pets and you're dividing them. Okay. Do a trial run. If there's already two homes, divide the animals before you're done with the settlement agreement. Divide the animals, look at how they're doing, bring in a trainer to assess the behavior and see if you need to modify your decisions in terms of where the animals are going to live. I think that would be a really smart thing to do because honestly, animal trainers can tell you so much about how your animal is reacting in different situations so that you as a pet owner can make the absolute best decisions for your animals. All right, so I hope this episode was helpful because pet custody is second to child custody and so seriously important to the pet owners and pet owners, pet parents and their children.
They're sweet, adorable animals. So thank you for listening. Please share this with anybody you know going through this situation. If you haven't already subscribed, please do so. Hit like if you like this episode. And as always, have an amicable day.